Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Joy's Christmas Escape by P. Creedon. And this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter One. What's that over there? Sam the barber asked, pointing toward the east. A storm had just passed over, and Marshal Jack Bowling had been looking west, toward the sunset where the sky was already brightening for the moments just before sunset. The slightest drizzle still hung in the air, dripping a drop or two now and then. But, following Sam's question, he looked the direction the man pointed. Against the still stormy sky, a dark column of smoke rose darker than the clouds above it. He frowned. Looks like fire. He picked up a, picked up a jog and headed toward the livery, calling over his shoulder. Get the men of town together. We may be needing a bucket brigade. You bet, Sam yelled back. Jack knew he could count on Sam to get most of the men in town on board to help. No one wanted a fire to spread. He couldn't pinpoint exactly where the fire was, but he imagined that it was a bit outside of Virginia City, possibly in one of the farm homes nearby. When he reached the livery, he hollered inside, Clyde, grab as many buckets as you can. There's a fire. Clyde came out of a horse's stall with a pitchfork, his eyes wide. Which way? East. Jack answered as he stepped to the paddock just outside the livery and grabbed a hold of his chestnut gelding red. Quickly, he swung a saddle on the horse's back and cinched the girth loosely. No matter what kind of hurry he was in, Jack had a promise to keep with red. He'd never tighten the cinch too fast and would always give the gelding time to adjust before pulling the leather strap hard. He then reached over the horse's head and pulled the bridle up over his ears. Once it was buckled in place, Jack led red forward a couple of steps before pulling the cinch strap tight. He tied it in its knot and then shoved a foot into the stirrup and swung it into the saddle. Before he was all the way up, Red was already moving forward, seeming to sense the urgency in Jack's movements. Once in the saddle, Jack reined the horse to the east. He didn't know how long Red had been sitting since he dropped him off at the livery a couple hours before the storm came. Early October storms had still had remnants of the power of those in the late summer. Fall couldn't come soon enough. He was sick of the hail and lightning. He huffed. Might have been lightning that caused this fire. Even as he started letting his gelding jog in the direction of the smoke, he sent up a quick silent prayer that no one would be hurt. The cloud over the black column was already thick and wide and continuing to spread. It was worrisome to see the clouds like that. Likely, it meant that the fire had been raging for at least a little while. But no one would have noticed because the stor storm had kept everyone inside. Jack himself had been in the barber shop getting a shave to pass the time while he waited out whatever the storm would bring. There hadn't been a lot of rain in this one, but the hail had been about dime-sized and the thunder had rumbled for at least an hour. He thought back to the one big crack that had shaken the building about 45 minutes ago, and suddenly he wondered if this fire might have been the result of the lightning that had caused that peal. After a short bit, his horse picked up a lope. He rounded the bend, and in the distance, it was becoming easier to determine exactly where the fire might be coming from. And immediately, his heart sank. The lope became a gallop as he opened Red up and asked him to move faster. The smoke was coming from a location much too close to his old family home. His sister's house. Another prayer went up as he groaned. No, please don't let her be hurt or the twins. The two cherub faces flashed before his mind as his stomach squeezed and he felt a little nauseous. Unfortunately, the closer he got to the fire, the more certain it seemed that it was coming from Penelope and her family's house. As he galloped closer, he found a small crowd of neighbors already trying to form a bucket brigade from the well to the house, but there were only a few of them. A measure of relief hit Jack when he saw his little niece and nephew standing together in their nightgowns with a young woman. They were safe. Thank the Lord. He ran straight for them, pulling up a ho his horse when he, he was a few yards away and launching himself from the saddle. Penelope! The young woman stood and turned about, and that's when he realized the young woman wasn't his sister. It was Grace Scott from across the street. He blinked, his pace faltering for a moment as he took in more of his surroundings. It was then he noticed two bodies that had been covered by blankets nearby, and the world tilted and spun as Grace started speaking to him. But for the ringing in his ears, he couldn't hear a word she said. Dressed in black, Joy stood before a freshly dug grave, watching as the gravediggers began shoveling in the dirt that would bury her beloved grandmother. 
How could it be so sunny out when the only family that Joy had ever had in the world, the only person who'd ever loved her, was being buried? Geese flew overhead, making such a racket in their migrations that Joy's own sobs were drowned out. The late October breeze blew in the treetops, sending multicolored leaves to swirl around her in the gravesite. In the past, Joy had always loved the fall. It was a blessed respite from the hot summers in Memphis. It was when school started for the children and when Joy had the most hope for the coming school year. But that had been shadowed by the illness that had plagued her grandmother for the last few months. Even though her grandmother had told her that everything was all right and that she should continue to go to the schoolhouse and work, Joy had known better. She regretted listening to her grandmother's pretense. Instead of starting the school year, she should have stayed home and taken care of her grandmother. Maybe then her grandmother wouldn't have died so soon. Maybe then Joy would have been able to take care of her and spend more time with her at least. But she knew that she couldn't have given up the income from teaching at the school. Modest though it was, it helped pay for the medicine to keep her grandmother from the pains she had. Miss Stewart, a deep gruff voice said from behind her. Swiping at the tears on her cheeks, she turned around, preparing to give a false smile to whoever might be waiting to give her their condolences. But instead, she found a man who was standing much closer to her than she'd expected, a taller, larger man than she'd ever seen before, and she had to tilt her neck back just to meet gazes with him. She furrowed her brow in confusion. Um, yes, I'm Miss Stewart, he nodded, taking hold of her elbow. I knew as much. Come with me, please. Immediately, he started guiding her away from the gravesite. Although the man had said please, it felt like a platitude. There was no denying the brute. When she grew slow to follow, his grip on her elbow tightened, causing her chest to tighten in fear as well. Where are you taking me? Just come along. She swallowed hard, her feet catching her as she almost tumbled. Still, she followed knowing she didn't have much choice but to do as he said. If she tried to stop, the reprobate would probably likely drag her. They continued to make their way down the hill toward the gravel road that led out of the yard when a black stagecoach pulled by two dark horses came into view. For some reason, the sight of it caused the hairs on the back of Joy's neck to stand on end. It was as if the Grim Reaper himself might be hiding behind the dark curtain in, in the window. Her heart raced in her chest as she was pulled out a halt just as outside the door of the carriage. The brute, who had been manhandling her, kept a hand on her elbow, but stepped forward and knocked on the side of the carriage. Mr. Pomeroy, this here is Miss Joy Stewart. Her stomach began to quiver, and even though there was a slight chill in the breeze, she'd begun to, begun to perspire. What did these people want with her? With a quick swish, the curtain on the carriage opened, revealing a balding, spectacled man with beady black eyes. He looked her up and down and quirked an eyebrow. Then he smiled, showing pronounced buck teeth that reminded her of a rat or beaver. So you're the lone heir to Madame Henrietta Stewart? Frowning, but feeling only slightly less afraid, Joy refused to answer. What did this man want with her, and how would he know anything about her or her grandmother? Then the brute at her elbows shook her. Answer, Mr. Pomeroy, woman. Now, now, Big Donald, don't be too rough with the lady and show her the respect enough to call her miss. After all, she is a schoolteacher, not a saloon girl. Yes, sir, the scoundrel lightened his grip on her arm, but only slightly. Excuse me, miss, but please answer Mr. Pomeroy. Joy swallowed hard, unsure of what was going on. How did this man even know her name, much less her occupation? What did it seem that this man knew so much about her, but she'd never heard of him or seen him before in her life? What was going on? Her vision crowded with black dots and she feared she might faint, but she bit the inside of her cheek in desperation to get a hold of herself. The last thing she wanted to do was faint in front of these villains. The pain in her cheek was sharp but bearable and it helped to scatter the dots that had threatened to take hold of her. Coppery blood trickled up upon her tongue and she managed to regain her composure. Her hands fisted at her sides and she yanked her elbow from the brute's grip. Anger overwhelmed the fear she'd felt moments before. What is this all about, sir? Why would this, this ruffian drag me all the way down here to meet with someone I do not know? The smile upon the man's lips didn't change, but his eyes flashed a bit with something like amusement. 
Are you angry now, Miss Stewart? I apologize for my man's mishandling of you. It was disrespectful. I'll ask that he not lay a hand upon you again if that will make you happy. His sudden sweetness was more unnerving than his appearance. She rubbed at her elbow and didn't say anything again. She wasn't certain just how to respond to this man, but his speech did deflate the anger she'd been building. The stranger shrugged and pushed open the carriage door. Joy had to step backwards to keep the man from invading her space. He paced a, placed a bowler upon his head. The felt hat was only a few shades darker than the brown suit that he wore. He stood at eye level with her, a small, mousy man who seemed to be the opposite of the heathen who'd grabbed her by the elbow before, but somehow more dangerous. Her hair stood on end again while he looked her up and down, taking measure of her. Her voice shook as she asked, Mr. Pomeroy, was it? Could I ask what business you have with me? His brow lifted again. You are a pretty one, aren't you? Shouldn't be surprising, even as an old crone, you could tell that Mrs. Henrietta Stewart was quite the looker back in her day. My father had said as such. It was one of the reasons that he was so quick to give her the loans that she asked for. Joy frowned. What loans? <laughs> what loans? The man chuckled and shook his head. Then he began pacing around her in a circle. Surely you're not going to play ignorant with me, are you? I already know that you're not stupid. After all, you are a school teacher. How how would you know I'm a school teacher? She asked, feeling a bit breathless. Make it my business to know as much as I can about those who owe me debts. And since Miss Henrietta Stewart is now no longer able to pay her debts, the burden, unfortunately, is passed on to you, Miss Joy Stewart, as the former's only living heir. The shiver that be had started in Joy's stomach began to quake in earnest. What? What do you mean? I have no early earthly idea what you're talking about. She hated that she couldn't stop the shaking or remove the slight whine out of her voice. The man stopped directly in front of her, narrowing his beady black eyes and taking her chin in his hand. Whether you want to play dumb or actually are dumb enough to think that your grandmother could live at that house where you've ma made your home the last 15 years without employment or indebtedness, it doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is that your grandmother owes my family $2,400. And I've come to collect. 